Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. In speaker for the evening, Johnny from Long Beach. Hi, everybody. My name is Johnny, and I'm an alcoholic. Glad to be here tonight. Uh, glad to be sober. I want to thank my friend Larry for uh, extending the privilege of me participating at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's uh, my opinion, and I hope it always remains such, that it's some type of a privilege to be allowed to come and sit in these rooms. I have never been able to get through my sick head that I have a right to everything that goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I was lucky enough to stumble here and get sober and stay that way. And the reason I tell you that is because everything that's good and decent in my life today is the byproduct I discovered of the God I discovered sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I'm extremely pleased to be here tonight, uh, fully clothed and in my right mind. <laughs> Well, I can't say that about all of you, but uh, I just speak for myself. And the reason I tell you that is not for any kind of humor or joke or nothing. It seems like the longer I stay sober, the more necessary it becomes for me to remember from whence I came. And I don't ever want to forget that a little over 56 years ago today, I came to in a cell in solitary confinement, a maximum security penitentiary, drifting in and out of total insanity. And because of a loving God has expressed himself through our program called Alcoholics Anonymous, it's no longer necessary for me to crawl around on, hand, on my hands and knees like an animal. And if I don't get nothing out of this deal at all, I could live with that all the way back to my car tonight. It makes me feel good. Now, I'd really like to stand here and go along with some type of this new theme that that's where alcohol and drugs took me to. No. That's where I took me to. The only thing that alcohol and drugs ever did in my life that kept me alive long enough to get to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm as sure as I'm standing here, if I hadn't taken a drink, I'd have probably blown my brains out before I was nine years old. It seemed like to me, as far back as I can remember, and so it's been revealed in my life, to the application of this program of recovery in my life on a daily basis, it seemed like to me that I was born needing some type of an answer. Now, the problem with that is I didn't know what my problem was. Kind of hard to seek the answer to a problem if you don't know what the problem is. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm restless and irritable and discontented. I don't like anything that's around me. And I don't understand that. I didn't understand that until I got here that those are the symptoms of the most deadly illness that's ever been known to mankind. My sponsor says there's written history that stretches back almost 4,000 years of our illness. Now, I don't know that. I know a lot about drinking. Everybody in my family drank. They were Irish. We're supposed to drink. <laughs> they didn't have any religion to hold their guilt down, so they just went crazy. I mean, they lived in whorehouses, they lived in penitentiaries, they beat each other up, they stole each other's women, they drank each other's whiskey. They just had a hell of a time, I guess. I guess if you would explain that today, you'd probably say they were dysfunctional. Uh, didn't seem like to me. That didn't seem to bother me any. I'm looking for a way out of this dilemma that I'm in. I don't know what's going I remember, I remember sitting, laying on a therapist's couch once upon a time, what seemed to be my want from time to time in my happy, joyous journey through life, uh, wearing a straight jacket probably uh, because I was such a wonderful person sober. And he said to me, didn't that family of yours scar you? And at that particular time, I was in my victimization situation, just when victim was being popularized. Oh, yeah, I said. Man, yeah, I have nightmares about that stuff I had as a child. and I, yeah, 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 yeah. Anything to get the heat off me. 
If I was to answer that question, to answer that question today, I would tell him in all honesty, no, he didn't lay a glove on me. Even then, I was so consumed with my selfishness and self-centeredness, I didn't have the ability to look out beyond me for anything at all or what was going on around me. I'm only interested in what's going on with me. And I'm uncomfortable. And I'm restless. I'm looking for a way out. I don't see any end of this dilemma. And they're standing in shining light as my grandmother. Now, my grandmother lived till she was 90 years old. She never took a drink of alcohol or smoked a cigarette her life. Now, my grandmother wouldn't think it's a big deal if I lived in November. I've been sober for over 55 years. Big deal, she'd say. I ain't had a drink for 90. (laughs) (laughs) I used to tell her, you ought to have a couple, Granny, make you feel better. (laughs) My grandma got everything she needed out of this church she went to. I used to watch her as a little boy because I spent a lot of time with him because my people were all busy. And so Grandma used to get up on Sunday morning where they tore her house up the night before. Bodies laying everywhere, house in all disarray. Grandma put the best thing she had on, and she stepped over the bodies and went somewhere. I don't know where she went, but when she came back, something had happened to her. She was a little lighter in her step, a little easy in her being. Kind of danced around these people and cleaned them up and sang songs to Jesus. Now, I took a look at that. And I filed that in my keen alcoholic mind. And so I made a big mistake. I think that all I'm going to have to do now is go where Grandma goes and do what Grandma does. I'd be like Grandma. But you see, I, I'm not like Grandma. I didn't know that. My grandmother was not alcoholic. I didn't know that. So I went and sat in church with my grandmother's little boy. I sat there and waited while they said this stuff and watched her. She's getting it going over there. I ain't getting nothing going. And I said to her, when am I going to get mine, Granny? He said, when you go down front. Oh, I went down front. Nothing happened down there that I know about. <laughs> no blinding flashes of light. I didn't get a halo and wings and start flying around a room somewhere. <laughs> I discouraged. I went back to Grandma and said, when's it going to happen? She said, when you get sprinkled. <laughs> All I know about that was it got wet. There's nothing wrong with my grandmother's church. There's nothing wrong with anybody's church. There was something wrong with the jackass sitting in the room, me. See, what I'm doing, I don't know this because I hadn't been here. I hadn't investigated our book. I I, I don't know it. I'm looking for something way out here to make me feel better in here. And it only goes to prove to me that the problem's always been there. And my answer came, sitting on the back porch of my grandfather's house with my grandfather, watching him drink whiskey out of a fruit jar. He put it down, went somewhere, and I picked it up and took a drink of it. That's all. And I guess, according to the only authority in Alcoholics Anonymous, our book, the next couple of minutes of my life was what makes me an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic because I spent the next 20 years of my life creating mayhem out there. I'm an alcoholic because I have some type of an abnormal reaction to alcohol. Now, it's not a bad reaction, if you want to know the truth. (laughs) If it had been a bad reaction, you'd have another talker here tonight. (laughs) I kind of get tired of people getting up here bad-mouthing whiskey. (laughs) Oh, I don't like the taste of it. That's made me snot my nose, blow, and peed my pants, you know, blah, blah, blah. I want to go up there and slap them. <laughs> That's like bad mouth and an old girlfriend. You know what I mean? Just best friend I ever had, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Kept me alive long enough to get here. But see, I'm not ready what happened to me next because it doesn't happen to everybody that drinks. It only happens maybe out of one out of ten people who ingest alcohol to get this uncommon reaction to it. See, what happens to me Once I put alcohol into my system, then and only then am I drinking to overcome a craving that's beyond all human understanding and beyond all human help. I did not know that. Not at all. And three days later, I was pulled out from underneath a bridge and stood in front of a judge and sentenced to the Hutchinson State Reform School. They didn't want another one of these people coming around their town. 
20 years later, I took a drink of alcohol. He pulled me out of a car in Compton, stood me in front of a judge, and sentenced me to 20 years in the penitentiary. Now, that's what happened to me when I drank. I got drunk and went places. I <laughs> traveled around. Okay? I went from reform school to reform school to junior penitentiary to penitentiary to nut houses. Now they call them treatment centers. <laughs> I like Nuthouse a little better. A little more macho. Come on, if you want to be bad for Christ's sake, be bad. I mean, don't quit drinking because you puke a little. Hang in there. <laughs> give it up. Give it all to it. AA works a lot better when you get your butt kicked. If you, I threw everything into the battle. Everything. I threw my life into it, every ability that I had every type of attributes I had, my family, my health, my sanity, everything. I threw it all in there and didn't have a clue what was happening to me when I came to in that cell in solitary confinement at Maximum Theater Penitentiary, 26 years old. And I'm doing the same thing, crawling around on my hands and knees in that cell I was doing at my grandmother's knee in my grandmother's church. I'm looking for an answer to whatever it is that's killing me, but I don't know what the problem is, so I don't even know where to look. And I don't know what's going on. I only know that that day when I came to in that cell, there wasn't a single solitary soul left upon the face of this earth that would send me a penny postcard. They were all gone. But you know what? They should be gone. And I don't have any right to have them back just because I don't drink anymore and go to be. It's all good and decent because of this God I discovered sitting in your meeting. Now, that's what's stumbling into your meetings of Alcoholics now. November the 4th, 1959, I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics now. I'm sitting in a penitentiary. I'm sitting around with my gang, and we're sitting around talking. We're waiting for the connection to come out of the visiting room so we can get loaded. Well, that's what you do. You sit around and wait and wait and wait and wait and get mad at the waiting don't pay off. And I saw these women walk across the yard, and I got up and left my gang and followed them into an old quantity hub of building. I sit down in the back row where people like me sit. I ain't going to move up too close. Somebody might think I'm a member of AA or whatever this is. I don't join nothing. I joined a gang in Juvenile Hall, and that took me to hell and back. I don't know what this is. And I'm sitting there. I see there's two big A's on the backboard up there. They didn't have anything written on the wall. And I said, this guy said, what's this? He says, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. I sunk down in my seat. I didn't know if I see the big gangster hanging out with them winos. Big gangsters anonymous or over hip anonymous. <laughs> ring tail baboons anonymous or wear rings and both ear rings anonymous. Dope fiends and I. Boy, you can get into that, can't you? Dope fiend business. Makes addicts seem a little candy ass to me. I, just, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. How would I know? I hadn't read the doctor's opinion. Nobody ever said, you're alcoholic, you better go to AA. They weren't advertising for us in those days. How would I know what's wrong with me? I've been a ward of the state of California for almost 19 years with some of the finest therapy and psychiatry that the world has ever known. And you know what them great, brilliant people told me every time I sit across the desk from them after a series of electroshock treatments in my straitjacket? Johnny, if you didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, you wouldn't have any problem. I'm in a straitjacket. I've just been electroshock treated three times. And he tells me if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have any. I'm not doing that, and I'm getting this. <laughs> What's wrong with you? See, what that did for me, it proved to me they don't know nothing. They don't know what's wrong with me. And they proved it in the early 1970s when they misdiagnosed our illness and called it a disease. 
And the only reason they did that is so they could treat it and make money off of it. That's the only reason. You can't treat what's wrong with me medically. It has to be a spiritual awakening according to what this book says. I don't know that. Sitting in that meeting that day, staring at an answer that I had sold my soul for. I don't recognize it. I don't know what the problem is. So how could I seek an answer? Don't look like an answer to me. Old people. These people must have been at least 40, 45 years old. <laughs> they ain't got nothing better to do but get in their car and drive 100 miles up those old back roads at their own expense to spend two hours talking to a room full of people who don't want to listen to them, people like me who sit in the back row and make fun of them. Let me tell you how sick that was. See, I'm a quick study. It took me a while to figure this out. Here I am sitting in the penitentiary. I don't know when I'm going home. And I'm making fun of people who are leaving in an hour. <laughs> oh, oh, but I'm hip. If I'd have had earrings, if I'd get some from my girlfriend, I'd have probably put them in my nose or something. I would get a kick out of our home group every once in a while. They'd drag one of these little hipsters up, dragging his feet, dragging his little walk that I invented years ago. <laughs> He come run up there and he got his earrings in and he's looking at me and I said, your girlfriend called me. He said, why would my girlfriend call you? I said, she wants her earrings back. <laughs> I, I, I went an awful lot of friends like that. Guy said to me just the other day, he said, hey, hey, it's changed, hasn't it? I said, nah. He said, that's changed some, and I said, oh, yeah, well, the fellowship, yeah, in a little way. He said, well, how's it changed in your opinion? I said, when I got here, the men had tattoos and the women wore earrings. <laughs> that's the only change. You know what you proved to me when I was new? That I was an alcoholic. You know how you proved to me that I was an alcoholic? You got up here and told me that you were sober and you never had it so good. The life takes on a new being. I used to drink a couple times a day, three times a month, 14 gallons of whiskey every six seconds. Well, last week I lived in a dumpster. Tomorrow I'm going to give my daughter away to the winning football star, USC. You graduate with honors. And I'm sitting back there as physically sober, the guy saying that, and I'm saying to myself, I can't not be alcoholic. How could I be alcoholic? I'm as physically sober as that guy, and he's got all this good thing going for him, and I'm sitting back there stone crazy wanting to kill him. How could I be alcoholic? And see, I didn't know because I hadn't investigated a program of recovery that's outlined in the book. I hadn't under, I hadn't gotten in there yet. I'm like a lot of people who just come in and think all they got to do is put their butt in a seat somewhere, <laughs> and they're good. Well, that's true if you're a drinker. It's not true if you're an alcoholic. Not true at all. I'm trying to equate a serious, deadly, spiritual malady the book describes with a drink of alcohol. Nothing could be further from the truth. The only thing alcohol ever did for me, it made me not care. That's all. It made me not care. It took away the nightmares at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's what it did. So how could I be alcohol? But why am I sober today? What happened? There was no fantastic spiritual awakening. A man wandered into this panel one day, a man that I knew did 23 flat years in the penitentiary. And he stood at a podium of Alcoholics Anonymous, this little man, or bandit. His name was Les Hamlin. He's dead now. I've been dead a long time. He stood at a podium of Alcoholics Anonymous, told me something that all the great 
psychiatrists and sociologists and penologists in the state of California didn't know. He looked down where I was sitting and he said, you don't have to live like this no more if you don't want to. You don't have to do it like this. Nobody had ever said that to me. They said it. They told me not to drink. Don't do this. Don't do that. And they told me I was sober. Nobody said to me, you don't have to live like this no more. I went up to him after the meeting. I said, how do you learn how to live? I ain't interested in being sober from that day to this day. I want to know how I can lay down and sleep all night without some type of high-powered sedative in my system. Or I have to wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with cold sweats, nightmares of sitting handcuffed with two detectives out of gravesite while they bury my 17-year-old brother. And my mother staring at me with all the hate and venom in her life almost drove her nuts before she died. That's my nightmare. Thousands and counts of faces of people I'd harmed on my selfish, self-centered walk through life. That's what sobriety was to me. And you talk about being sober, take it and shove it. I don't want to be. I am sober and I don't like it. I don't want to be sober. One of the guys I sponsored said to me the other night, he said, but you were just tired when you got here, Johnny. No, I wasn't. Not the least bit tired. I was resigned to live the way I lived for the rest of my life. I was resigned to what they'd been telling me since I was nine years old in juvenile hall, that I was going to die in an institution, die of an overdose, die in a gang fight, but the police were going to shoot me. I had resigned myself to that fact. There's no light at the end of the tunnel, and this didn't look like home. <laughs> I just hear, I knew I was home when I got here. I want to say, what the hell did you live in? <laughs> I asked him, how do you learn how to live? He looked at me, and because he knew me, I was his star second baseman for the San Quentin Pirates for a couple of years when he was the manager. <laughs> and he said, Johnny, there's a book called Alcoholics Anonymous in the library. If you go get that book, I'll go home and pray that you find some part of you in it. So I went over to the prison library the next day and stole the book I called it. No. <laughs> well, I, I, you got to understand this. Yeah, I got a big time gangster image. I mean, I, I'm way to loco, the white nut. How <laughs> I, I embellished that? Damn near killed me, but I hung on to it, baby. <laughs> a few of you ought to understand that. I opened the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, not to get sober and live this good life that I've been given here. Not at all. That ain't in my plan. That ain't it. I'm reading your book, all right. But what I'm reading for is to come back and tell you, you don't understand. My case is different. It won't work for me. The loser's theme song in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> oh, you don't understand. My case is different. I'm an alcoholic and... Uh, yeah, you're an alcoholic and an idiot. <laughs> but you are. You cannot stay sober here different. It is impossible for an alcoholic to stay in this group around these people who care about them, who are recovering from this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, and be different because being different tells you, I don't have to do what you do. My case is different. That's why you're an idiot. Because you're looking at success stories and you don't even recognize it because your case is different. When I got these guys on sponsor start talking to me about their case is different, I start speaking Mexican to them. <laughs> Adios. I was reading in this book, in a book, I read this book in a book, I was in a thing called The Doctor's Opinion. And anybody wants to know whether an alcoholic or not, I'll read The Doctor's Opinion. It's the best description of our illness that's ever been put to pen by anybody. And I read this thing about this phenomenal craving thing. And I started to think about this. Because I didn't just 
you know, not had, I had a lot of talent. I was given the, the physical attributes to be able to play Major League Baseball. Physical attributes. I could have played Major League Baseball. I was offered a scholarship to go to a major university to play baseball when I was in a reform school. I was given a contract to play baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals in 1951 while I was at San Quentin State Penitentiary. I never got to UCLA or I never got to St. Louis. And the reason I didn't, according to me, was where I came from. Join that gang at Juvenile Hall. Did all these things that we do. Drunken people, things, death of my little brother, on and on and on it went. <clears throat> and I discovered in my insanity that the reason none of these things came to pass because I took a drink, period. Then the drink took a drink, and then the drink took me. Out came the straitjacket, out come the handcuffs, out come the shock therapy, out come the therapist, out come the psychiatrist. But not until I drank. That's the only way I've ever stopped drinking. It had to be stopped. Right then and there, I did something I did this morning. Done every day for over 54 years of my life since I read that part of that book. I assumed the responsibility for my own actions. Me. I did the thing. It's not alcohol's fault. It's not drugs' fault. It's not the gang's fault. It's not my mother's fault. The fair, but I'm the guy. I'm the guy that did the deed that created the hell that I lived in. I'm the guy that did it. I'm the guy who created the deed that wouldn't let him sleep at night. I'm the guy. Drugs didn't do that. Alcohol didn't do that. My gang didn't do that. None of that stuff happened. I'm the guy that did it. I assume the responsibilities for my own action, good, bad, or indifferent. That's the way it was. Shortly thereafter, I walked out of a man's office where I spent three and a half hours with him telling him about every rotten, filthy, crap thing I'd ever done. I told that man things sitting in that interview that would have kept me in the penitentiary for the rest of my natural life. One reason and one reason only. The book said, not me, the book, that I got to be searching and fearless and thorough because I'm trying to build an ark to walk a free man. And if there's anything I know about the alcoholic, I know they want to be free. Now, I'm not talking about being out of an institution or free from a divorce or a marriage or whatever. They want to be freedom from the bondage of self because that's the thing that's killing them. That's what I know. I spent the next year or so of my life in that penitentiary trying to clean up the wreckage of my past letters to judges because in my day there was a thing called secret indictment and I was available to those probably and so when I walked out of the penitentiary on June the 4th 1961 all I wanted to do was come and sit in a meeting I said to myself if they will give me the privilege of coming and sitting in their meeting I'll do anything they ask me to do. I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that for over 53 years of my life, I have done just about everything that Alcoholics Anonymous has asked me to do. Oh, I don't do it all willingly. <laughs> I didn't jump up this morning and say, I just can't wait to get home from my golf game, take care of my little dog, and get my car, and drive to San Diego and line up for whatever it was we had on the table out there. <laughs> Your meatballs were good. <laughs> you know why I do it? Somebody did it for me. I have a legacy that's been passed down to me from the people who were here when I got here. 
They kept it alive so a clown like me could wander into the room and sit here and be given a purpose for living. That's all. You see, there's nothing here to get. If you're an alcoholic, you brought everything that you need to have, you brought it into the door. The only thing we have here is an opportunity to be of service to God and to the people about it. That's it. But you have to uncover and discover what's wrong with you. Nobody comes to alcoholics and I was knowing what an alcoholic is. Then somebody says, you're an alcoholic, go to A. No. That don't make you alcoholic because some clown who's getting paid says that. You have to discover. It was read here tonight. The great thing about chapter 3, second paragraph is this. We have to fully concede to our innermost self that we're alcoholic. That don't mean a thing to me. It just means that I got to give it up. Okay. I'm alcoholic. What I got to do to get over it? What do I got to do to live comfortably enough where I never have to drink again? What do I have to do? And to where do you get that? Well, some clown by the name of Norm Alpey told me that he was going to be my sponsor. I said to him, what's that? I mean, you got the answer, all the answers. You knew you got all the answers anyhow. You got answers for questions nobody even asked you about. <laughs> you want to have fun? Go ask a newcomer what their plan is. <laughs> I said, what's that, Norm? What's the sponsor? He said, I'm going to help you get things done that need to be done, Johnny. I said, oh. What do you want me to do then? He said, why do you ask me? I said, you just told me you were going to be my sponsor, Norm. He said, Johnny, if I can't run my life, what makes you think I can run yours? (laughs) Now I'm really screwed. I said, then what am I supposed to do? He said, why don't you just do what I do? I said, what is it you do? He says, if you do what I do, then you'll know what I do. I just broke up the great mystery of sponsorship for you, (laughs) called Monkey See, Monkey Do. Be careful. A lot of people run around here monkeys who ain't monkeys. They tell you a lot of stupid stuff. Don't drink no matter what. (laughs) Do you know that alcoholics drink no matter what? (laughs) How many of you waited for Thanksgiving to drink in July? The book says, which is the only authority in Alcoholics Anonymous, the book says that unless I can adopt certain spiritual principles and actions into my life, I cannot overcome drinking. But you see, I'm an alcoholic. There's a difference between an alcoholic and a drinker. A drinker can quit given any type of reasonable excuse, never drink again. They don't need a spiritual experience or come to meetings. They just don't drink, no matter what. Me. That man took me on a ride that almost got him killed three or four times. Left me standing on a street corner because he didn't think I would dress properly to come to see you. <laughs> I'm comfortable. I had on my shorts, my flat thongs, and my thing. If I had a hat, I'd probably had it on backwards. Drove up, took one look at me, and drove off. <laughs> I didn't have a car because I didn't have a driver's license, so he wouldn't let me have a car. It, citizens like him had a right to be protected from jerks like me. <laughs> it's always had a statement for everything about this stuff. It just hurt me terribly. You see how wounded I am here. <laughs> one night I called him up. I don't know. I was in some type of pity pot. It's a good way to get your sponsor if you're new, if you have one. If you don't have one, just turn your deep ear up. You're up with on help anyhow. You got a fool running your life. Keep it up. I said, I don't have a sponsor. You must have a fool running your life then. (laughs) These sponsorless people are pissed off right now. I 
I said, Norm, I need to go to a meeting. That always gets them. Always gets you. I need to go to a meeting. I had a terrible day. I talked to him. He yelled at me at work. I need to go to a meeting. You know what I mean? All right, I'll be by there at 6 o'clock, Jack. I have to be standing on the street corner. I ain't waiting for you. <laughs> he drove up. I stuck my head in the wind and said to him, where are we going, Norm? He said, we ain't going nowhere. And he drove off. <laughs> <clears throat> and he said to me when I called him up, to complain you called up and sniveled and whined and cried and begged me to come by and pick you up and take you to a meeting yeah the first thing you said out of your dumb mouth when I opened the car where are we going where the hell do you think we're going to a dance a poker game what's going on with you goofy you asked to go to a meeting I tell you he was my sponsor for 22 years before he dropped dead. Kind of inconsiderate, don't you think? Just right before my birthday. Not one time and the hundreds of times I got into his car from that day that I ever say to him, where are we going? <laughs> I just said, hi, sponsor. Good to see you. And I... I learned to love him a great deal, and it had been 31 years since he robbed dead. I've had another sponsor for over 30 years. But Norm Alpe will always be my sponsor. If he was alive, he'd still be my sponsor. I don't believe that people ought to change sponsors just because their sponsor doesn't agree with them. Not at all. Be good enough to help me when I'm new. They'll be good enough to help you when I'm old. Don't change. Message doesn't change here. The actions change, but the message doesn't change here. One alcoholic talked to another alcoholic to get them to do things that they wouldn't normally do anyhow. And so what's the final goal? Staying sober until you're so dry you're a fire hazard, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Not the goal. The goal here is to be of usefulness to God and to the people about you. That's what the goal is here. The goal is to pass this thing along to somebody. The way to see somebody else take what Norm Shep Chamberlain gave me and pass it on to the guy that's coming in the door today, 50-some years later. The same message holds true today that held true 55 years ago when I got here. The book has the whole kit and caboodle in there. Anybody who will apply this program to their life, I'm not talking about work in the program. Alcoholics don't like the word work. <clears throat> we take these steps. And then what happens to them? You hear people say, I'm working on step 12. I don't work on a step. Not at all. I've never tried to work on getting rid of my defects of character. There's a lot of people who know me that know that that hasn't been much of a benefit. <laughs> <clears throat> because my book says I don't work on them. My book says I make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand it. And the prayer said, God, I offer myself to thee to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that victory over them may be witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy will. It takes me out of the picture. That's what it's all about, getting me out of the picture. Me is the problem. I look in the mirror every morning, and I say to myself, look here, God. I'm going to go out there and move it around a little bit. I hope I don't get me in anything you can't get us out of. <laughs> it, my life is that simple, folks. And then these jackasses I sponsor start phoning. <laughs> Not again. But what a joy that is. Somebody call you and ask you, tell you they had a good day. How am I doing? How are you doing? They care for me. I care for them. We have a great time. I've had the benefits 
of being practically adopted by this wonderful old man from Laguna Beach, my father, the only father I've ever known. And he taught me things that only a father would teach a son. He taught me of the real necessity of my service to God and the people about me. That it's a joy and a privilege to do it. It's not a chore. Not an effort. I get tired. I, I want to yell at people when they say, I come here tonight at great inconvenience. I want to tell them, to get the hell out of here. Be convenient, inconvenient going home. You're going to be inconvenient of going and trying to tell somebody that you've been recovering from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, but that's an inconvenient. That you've been pulled out of the throes of hell and stood right smack dab in the middle of heaven, and that's an inconvenient for you to talk about it. That's an inconvenience. It's a chore. It's work. It's an effort. You ought to go find some other program to be in. Or they appreciate that. Call (laughs) Al-Anon. But you see, their lives are not on the line. If you're an alcoholic, you are. I don't like the term family disease. I don't have a disease in the first place. When I came to in that cell in solitary confinement, I didn't find one of my family in there with me. (laughs) The time I stood in front of that judge and got sent to the penitentiary, there was nobody saying, oh, he's my son, I'll go to jail for him. Not at all. I'm the guy, I'm the culprit. I gotta find a God of my very own and I have to find a purpose for being and a direction to take. Al Anon has a great opportunity and a great benefit and a great purpose in being. But it's not to sober up alcoholics or run alcoholics wise. They take care of their own stuff. They got their own twelve step that they work on. They don't need me helping them. And I don't need them helping me. I do just fine with you and the people around me. God, as I've come to understand. My mother drank herself to death. I watched that. Powerless to do anything about it. Thirty years it took her, but I was there when she died. And I'd taken care of her as her son for almost thirty years of her life while she drank herself to death. The greatest lesson I ever learned, I learned from my mother. I don't have the power to get anybody sober. I don't have the power to get them drunk either. I don't even have any power to keep me sober. Where would I get it? Where would I get the seemingly endless supply of power that I've been given for over half a century of my life? Where would it come from? It comes from my God through you people through this program. So that's why I was coming back from a trip not very long ago, and I'm on an airplane, and I'm not much to do on an airplane. I don't like talking to people too much. <laughs> I'm a little antisocial to start with. And I'm thinking about this because I got a message while I was out of town that one of the guys I sponsored had taken an overdose and died. And it seemed like there'd been a series of them happening for about two weeks now. And the question popped up into my mind is, why was I given this gift? Why? Why have I been allowed to do this? My mother was a far better person than I was, and she never got to stay sober. Why? I have nothing special that I can figure it out. Why was I given this gift? It's not to get married and have a lovely home and a beautiful woman that I love and children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and a host of friends and to travel the world. It's none of that. It dawned on me that the only reason I've been given this gift so I could carry the message to the alcoholic that's still suffering. And if I ever back off from this gift and think that I don't have to do it, I think the gift will be removed from me I will end up sickened, drunken, insane and dead. I believe that with every fiber in me. 
So see, I still believe it's a privilege to come and sit in meetings to answer the phone when a friend like Larry says, will you come? And I'll say, yeah, I'll be there. And as long as I'm able to stand up, walk around and breathe in and out and take nourishment, as long as you want me to be in your presence and your company where I find my God and you wonderful people, believe me, I will always be here. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.